Hey, what's up guys? In today's video, we're going to start building Engine Simulator's 3D interface using my new Vulkan game engine. But first, I'd like to thank BeamNG, Reyna, Meister, Goldwolf, Jai Morgan, and Snow for supporting me at the Master Mechanic level on Patreon, and Brilliant for sponsoring this video. More about them later. Our story today starts here on the Engine Simulator Discord server. Engine Simulator Official is an interesting place with an interesting history. Around 9 months ago, there were around 60 members on this server, and I just released what I thought was an interesting but mostly inconsequential video about an engine simulation program that I had made. Just a few days later, I woke up to find the server had grown to thousands of members, and there were hundreds of people trying to figure out how to use Engine Simulator, something I didn't even intend to be used as a game or by anyone other than myself. The Discord server provided a window into how people played Engine Simulator and what they didn't like and what didn't work for them. I'm still pretty active in the server, I help people with questions, and I just observe how the community is evolving and how I can make a game that people will actually want to play. What's clear is, Engine Simulator is about more than just engine noises. In fact, I'm not even sure that it's about engines at all at this point, at least not engines from this planet. Engine Simulator seems to be more about expressing your creativity and personal style through machines, or virtual machines in this case. It's similar to how car modders express themselves through their vehicles in the physical realm. So the goal should be to allow players to create a wide variety of airflow-based machines, and being able to hear those creations is just another way of interacting with the game, and it adds an extra layer of immersion. The creation process should also have as few technical barriers as possible. So this would mean replacing the scripting interface used in the Engine Simulator prototype with some kind of graphical interface, which is what we're going to start building today. Thankfully the game engine is already built and more or less ready to use. I demonstrated the Vulkan renderer I created in this other video if you're interested. To formally start the Engine Simulator game project, the first step is to set up a CMake build script and the project repository. I like to set up my projects in such a way that I can work on the game engine and the game concurrently since I usually use my own game engines for my projects. I then built some functions to generate and render geometry, and this is critical because most assets in Engine Simulator are going to be procedurally generated, uh, which is not the case for a lot of games. Using these facilities, I generated a grid and axis display and rendered them to the screen. Um, and this looks terrible, for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, the grid is way too bright, so I adjusted it to be closer to the background color, and that reduces the contrast. The lines far off in the distance are also pretty distracting. Most modern CAD programs solve this problem by using fog to smoothly fade the grid out of view, and I use a similar technique. And it's already looking much better. Most CAD grids are also subdivided into finer and finer spacings. Having just a single grid level like this is a bit amateurish, so I fixed that, and also exposed a new problem in the process. It might be a bit hard to see in a YouTube video, but there are small artifacts where the grid lines intersect each other. This is caused by the grid lines Z-fighting. We can solve this by disabling the depth test, but still writing to the depth buffer anyway, and drawing the grid from back to front. This way, the Z-fighting is eliminated, but the grid will still appear in front of other objects in the scene where necessary. Next, I made the fade look a bit better and moved it closer to the camera since I can't imagine anyone using the grid 500 meters away from where they're standing. Finally, I added colored lines to mark the X and Y axes, and now our grid is done, and it actually looks reasonably professional. CAD interfaces are complicated because the user needs to interact with a 3D space using just two dimensions. That means we need to project the mouse into 3D space and figure out both what object it should be hovering over and later what specific point in 3D space it's even referring to. Depending on which working plane we choose, the mouse may be projected to different points in space. But for now, just as a test, I projected the mouse onto the main grid. This is done by finding the mouse's implied position on the view plane and tracing a ray from the camera to that position and following this ray all the way until it intersects with the ground plane. To demonstrate, I'm drawing a sphere at that intersection point. Projecting onto the ground plane is fairly easy, but projecting onto an axis or allowing the mouse to move objects in 3D space in an intuitive way is actually not that trivial. 
I spent a lot of time studying how Blender does it and reverse engineering the math behind it. Um, I guess I could just look directly at the Blender source code, but I'll leave that for another day. When I first started programming, I found matrix transformations and other 3D math to be really fascinating and something that I wanted to understand more. If you're in the same place right now, today's sponsor Brilliant.org will definitely be able to help you out. Brilliant allows you to learn math and science concepts with a wide variety of amazing interactive courses. This knowledge will seriously help you professionally and when working on your own side projects and games. A lot of the linear algebra and 3D math I used earlier is covered in Brilliant's Introduction to Linear Algebra course, which is a great course for beginners. Brilliant's courses focus on putting what you learn into practice immediately with meaningful practice problems so you can build intuition and real know-how. I've taken quite a few of them myself and can confidently say that Brilliant's interface is really polished and the courses really are at a college level. To try all of Brilliant's features for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash the great or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Once again, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now that we have a basic system for mouse projection and rendering primitives to the screen, we can start on what might be the most important element of Engine Simulator's gameplay, and that is the tube. Yes, you heard that correctly. If you're into engines, then you've probably heard the phrase, an engine is just a glorified air pump. And uh, to some degree, this is true. From a simulation perspective, an engine is even simpler than that. It's reduced all the way down to a network of one-dimensional air channels. A series of tubes, one might say. A series of tubes! This simplification is not something that I invented, and isn't some kind of insane, assume a spherical cow type of oversimplification either. It's pretty standard, even in the automotive industry. I feel like I needed to say that for the Reddit experts watching this who don't actually know anything about simulations. The most intuitive way of laying out tubes is by first creating a curve and then sweeping a profile along that curve. This is a pretty common operation in Blender using Bezier curves. Bezier curves are pretty simple to implement, so I added those to our user interface and after a bit of debugging, I got them displayed on the screen. The only issue is there's no way of interacting with or modifying these curves, so we need to add some widgets that show the positions of the Bezier control points. Using the ray projection method I described earlier, we can implement object picking using the mouse. This is a very simple implementation, and in the future I might just use the GPU instead, but this is fine for now. By projecting the mouse onto the current viewing plane, we can allow the user to move these points in 3D space. This viewing plane can be visualized in Blender as well. When I move the camera to the side, we can see that all the duplicates I made land nicely on this flat plane, which lined up with the camera's previous position. Since all the control points are only visual, moving them doesn't actually modify the curve. So we need to recalculate the curve and update the geometry submitted to the GPU whenever these points are moved. Before we do that though, I decided to simplify the Bezier interface a bit. If you've used Bezier curves in Blender, then you probably know how painful it can be sometimes to get them to cooperate. They are very versatile and generic, but this is kind of what makes them tedious at times. I implemented a simplification into the Bezier system to roughly emulate a real-life pipe bender. This makes creating decent-looking curves much easier and prevents the bends in the tube from looking too unrealistic. Finally, we can allow the user to extend the curve by adding new points. It's a bit glitchy right now because the program doesn't do anything to prevent physically impossible inputs, but this will definitely be fixed before the game is released. To make these lines three-dimensional, we need to generate a sweep. This means taking a profile and then extruding this profile across the length of the curve. The math for this is pretty straightforward, but there are a lot of edge cases that you have to be aware of. By sweeping a regular circular profile, we can generate the most stereotypical tube variety, which can be used to draw things like exhaust headers, which I'm going to show later in this video. We can of course sweep other profiles as well, like this square tubing, which I'll use later for a rectangle port intake design. For profiles that are not circular, the twist angle becomes important and it can change the appearance of the tube considerably. For now, the system doesn't allow the user to explicitly specify the twist and tries to infer a twist angle that remains consistent over the length of the curve. 
The final tube feature that we're going to add today is a way of controlling the profile scale along the length of the tube. This will allow for the design of simple collectors and horns. To smoothly interpolate between tube scaling, we can use the same Bezier code that was implemented previously. To make debugging a bit easier, I also created a file format to store these curves and load them on startup. This is pretty much all we need to demonstrate how the system will work in the context of the final game. We'll start with this mock layout of a V8 engine. The cylinders are just static right now and don't do anything. In the fluid simulation, each air passage is modeled as a one-dimensional channel which can be connected to other channels at a junction. We can use this information to model most of the air channels in this engine. We'll start with the exhaust headers. So headers are usually formed from cylindrical tubes in real life and there is generally one set of headers per bank of cylinders on a V8 engine. Each of the four tubes coming from the cylinder head is called a primary tube and they usually meet at a junction called the collector which then connects to the rest of the vehicle's exhaust system, which street vehicles are legally required to have. Using the simplified Bezier system I've implemented, drawing the headers is pretty easy, and the bends actually look similar to what you'd see in real life. The editing process is a bit crude right now, but it will be improved over time. This set of headers is now done, and we can repeat the process on the other side. Next, we can look at the intake. We can use a slightly more square profile for the intake runners, which run from a central plenum to the intake ports corresponding to each cylinder on the cylinder head. In this case, I'm modeling a typical dual plane intake, which actually has two plenums. After just a short time of using this system, I am already seeing many ways of making the user experience better. In the future, each of these parts will be grouped together, and the exposed endpoints will just snap to other exposed endpoints, creating a junction. That way the user can easily exchange common parts like intakes and headers uh, with parts from their own library or that they've downloaded. As you can imagine, being able to lay out fluid systems however you want opens up a lot of possibilities both in engine creation but also in the creation of other air-driven machines and systems. If you think that I'm sacrificing accuracy or detail by moving in this more generic direction, you'd be wrong. Underneath, Engine Simulator already supports all of these features they're just not exposed to the user. In my technical explanation video, I showed a variety of virtual machines that used Engine Simulator, like an air pump and even a simple refrigeration loop. You'll still get the same audio generation that Engine Simulator is known for, but you'll be able to create even more cursed and ridiculous engine designs, uh, which I know is what everyone actually wants. I'd like to thank all my supporters on Patreon and today's sponsor, Brilliant, for making this project possible. I'm having a lot of fun and uh, have a lot of cool things planned in the next few months, so hopefully you'll stick around for the journey. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you guys next time.